special song to be a great worship. Can we stand to our feet? And we're going to give, this is going to be a worship of high praises to God. Amen? Amen. We have victories in the house today. And we're going to give God all the glory. We have the song called Raise a Hallelujah. And we're going to clap. Okay? Let's go.
is our real God. That's so beautiful that the glory of the Lord is our real God. And just as Mount Zion cannot be moved, we who trust in you, Jesus, we shall not be moved, O God. No matter the situation, no matter the trial, no matter the problem, we want to thank you, God. And we can reveal your grace as we receive your grace in the situation, of God. We raise a hallelujah, Lord, this morning, Jesus. We raise a hosanna to you, Jesus. A hosanna in the highest. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you.
Just uh, every year we it passed away, and every December 31st we we look forward for the new year, and then we talk about you know what's going to happen in the year. But you know, I was asking one of the when 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 is the right time to wish for New Year? I said every day is <laughs> every day is a right time to wish New Year. But somebody said that yeah, you can wish uh, till 31st of January. So happy New Year to all of you. And <laughs> But you know, this is the this is the verse I'm going to uh, read about. Uh, Zechariah 29 verse 11 for the offering. There are a lot of uh, offering verses, but I choose to go with this one. Zechariah 29 verse um, uh, 11. Uh, it says, "For I know the plan that I have for you," declares the Lord, "plan for welfare, and for." And for uh, and for uh, and not for calamity to give you future and a hope. So isn't that amazing that we have hope in our eternal God who never changes, right? Like our future is different. Every day, every, our future tomorrow and um, coming days are depend upon God completely. We don't have to worry about anything, no. So I was uh, I was also reading this uh, Sam Sam's uh, 180:24. He said. Uh, uh, this is the day that Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, what an amazing! So, what's the? Thing? I was just thinking, like, if you and um, if if we were asked to present our 365 days plans in front of somebody and say, okay, what's you're going to do? So we don't have any calculations and measure. 
But you know what's amazing and what encouraging is that God knows our future and He He looks after us and He need He He knows our every needs and what we require. So He is in hundred percent control. And our encouragement is that we just give in joy and gladness and 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 we just rejoice in the body. Right? That's my encouragement. Uh, yeah, we look forward for the blessings. But the most important thing is that God has ordained one day for us, and we want to commit that day. For for, to the Lord and we want to give in uh, that way, right? Okay, let's just pray and then ask God for uh, every day to be a committed day for us. Lord, we just thank you very much for this wonderful time this morning, Lord. We pray that, Lord, we as we give this offering, Lord, uh, as you were already doing, Lord, use it for your own glory, Lord. And if there is anything we are we are we are taking your glory lord you use and tell us lord speak to our heart lord everything what we give is from you and through you lord and for your glory in jesus name we pray amen
a few verses from the Sermon on the Mount. So it's Matthew 5, and we'll just read um, maybe three verses. So, yeah. So, uh, Matthew 5, verse 3. So just before we start, again, on um, next Saturday, 2nd of February, we'll be in Verar. So again, it's just where our, maybe once every six weeks or so, we we'll go to different towns, different places, out in, in Mumbai and out into Maharashtra. So we'll meet at 10 o'clock in the morning at the uh, west side, the ticket office on the west side of the station, so in Barar, and we'll go from there. So you can message, um, there'll be a message group, but if you want any details, Rajan or Bishu or myself, you can ask. So we read it. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So uh, we pray, Lord, thank you. Uh, pray, Lord, that you would just minister to us, and Lord, that you would give us understanding and make this, Lord, profitable for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, he says, um, you know, these are blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. You know, that, that we you look for one translation for blessed is happy and to be envied are, are those people. Like, but the world places no value on these things at all. This is Jesus, his um, uh, instruction for happiness, his instruction for fullness of life. And it's, it's, but yet the world is no, puts no value on it at all. It kind of thinks that these characteristics a poor in spirit, uh, to be mourned, uh, to meekness, humbleness, they put no value on it. And um, But it's God's secret, like it's secret, he's hidden. It says that God has hidden these things from the wise and learned and chosen to reveal them to little babes such as us. And he, he's hidden it. The, the Bible says the heavens of heavens can contain God, but he dwells with those who are of a meek and a lowly spirit. Are meek and a contrite spirit. God is at home with the lowly. Uh, and when Jesus says that, we've and I heard it in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. I'm meek and humble of heart. Learn from me this, my nature. I'm meek and humble of heart. And if we learn that bit from him, that he's meek and humble of heart, we can learn everything else. It says in Psalm 25, the meek will he teach in the way. The meek will he, he guide. So we think of God, his power, his majesty, his infinity. He's immutable, he's eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present. And then he says, I'm meek and lowly of heart. And it's kind of, he hides this characteristic of himself underneath all these kind of uh, great kind of traits that he has. So um, uh, the meek will he teach in the way. So two verbs. Like the two verbs in the, any language, in English, the two most important verbs are to do and to be. Who I am, to be, and what I do. And it's who I am determines uh, what I'll do. And Jesus is very much concerned with to be, who I am. And this is what he, he deals with here, that we would be poor, blessed, and envied, and happy are those who are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. So poor in spirit doesn't mean kind of a low self-esteem feeling not good about yourself uh, it's not this neither is it is does it mean poor materially poor materially sometimes is good James says blessed are the poor materially for they are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom rich in faith because they have to so often rely on God and turn to God their faith is much richer than other people so James says blessed are the poor materially for theirs is the kingdom of God but not always is, is, is it. But poor in spirit is, the opposite is to be proud in spirit. And poor in spirit, he says, uh, and what it means like, is we, we have too high opinion of ourselves, And like we make these two mistakes. One is that we don't realize how high God is. We just don't realize how majestic, how holy, how pure he is. And we don't realize how low we are how sinful we are, how kind of like, you know, we are a blip, we, we, we are a vapor, and then we're gone. We just have a short, and we don't realize it. And because 
we don't see the gap is so big. We kind of feel, I can make up, if I'm a good person, if I do my best, I can make, but Jesus said, it's not the sick who need, uh, it's, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, it is not the righteous who need a savior, but the sinners. And it's that, it's the realization that we are a sinner. And really poor in spirit is kind of the realization is that I am a sinner. And no matter what I did do, if I gave everything I had, the psalm says, no payment is ever enough to pay to God that he could live and never see decay. And then the, the, the Micah says, what will I give for my sin? If I gave you 10,000 rams, if I sacrificed 10,000 sheep, or if I gave 10,000 rivers of oil, or if I gave my firstborn the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, it would not be enough. And when we kind of get to that place where we realize, I could never repay God for my sin, never. I couldn't even come close to it. I am, I am nothing in me. I am poor and I'm needy. Then we'll get to a place like the two men Pastor Shaker mentioned last week. They went to the temple and one said, I do this and I give these things to the poor and I say prayers and I am not like such and such. And the other man said, have mercy on me a sinner. So Jesus said, which of the two went away justified? And it was the man who was poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor because uh, theirs is the kingdom of God. And the other side of it is this, is that we become believers. We have come to Jesus Christ. He's taken away our sin. He's forgiven our sin. And now we, we follow God and we're washed. And then we start to live the Christian life. We start to go on the Christian way. And then I realize I can't do this thing. I, now I love God, now I want to serve God, but I can't do it. And Paul says, to will is present, I really want to do it, but I can't do it. The things I want to do, I don't do them. The things I don't want to do, I do them. And he gets caught in this. And he was, he was too honest a man. Paul was too sincere and honest a person to kind of just say, because he says this, he says, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, the best of the best. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was circumcised the eighth day. I kept all, concerning the law, blameless. I kept the whole commandments, blameless. And yet he was too honest a man to, not to admit that inside me I'm covetous. And he says, the law says do not covet. And I couldn't, he was too honest to, like, cause he could hide it from everybody but himself that I'm actually covetous and I'm proud and I'm ambitious and I am angry and I have fire and violence in him which, which came out of him. And he was too honest not to say that. And like the Pharisees didn't because they were blameless outwardly, they, they, they didn't. So he, he came to the place and he cried out, uh, I have no power in me to live the way I know I'm supposed to live. And he cried out, a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? He says, I don't have anything in me. I don't have any power in me. And he cried out then, there's nothing in me. And he said, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And then he called from God. Because as believers, if we still think that we have power in us to live the Christian life, to serve God, to do what God has called us to do inwardly, uh, We'll never call on the Lord. We'll never look for the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. But Paul got to that place and he said, A wretched man that I am, I have nothing in me. There's nothing in me. In my flesh dwells no good thing. And then he says, But thanks be to God. And he found the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. And he says, Paul says later, The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy the Holy Spirit and Paul realized I have no righteousness of my own that that trying to find a righteousness of my own I couldn't do it Martin Luther used to say this he was the one who started the Reformation he was a Catholic priest and he later left and he started the Reformation but he used to say he would wear his priests out but he says I hated the righteousness of God I hated it because it was a standard so high I could never meet it. And he tried with all his heart. And he would wear the priests out, his confessors out, confessing another sin and confessing another sin. And every day, and then I had pride, and then I did this, and then this. And the priest saying, we're trying to comfort him. 
And he said he hated the righteousness of God until he came to an end of himself and said, I can't do this. And unless God gives me the power, then there's nothing in me. And, and he found the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Because we don't have any righteousness of our own. But when Paul reached out and took the righteousness of God, he, he got it. And you can't have peace without righteousness. If you don't have righteousness, you can't have peace. And the, the self-righteousness doesn't give you a peace that lasts. You have to kind of just say, stay kind of smoothy and that kind of... But Paul couldn't do that because he knew inside of him. And he got a righteousness that went right down into the depths of him. And he got a peace that went to the depths of him. And a joy came out of that that God gave to him. Maybe just real quick, um, uh, we'll just mention this. Blessed are they that mourn. They'll be comforted. And... You know, to mourn again is not to mourn over a kind of different loss we have in life, worldly riches or position. But it's to mourn. Uh, you know, when we get saved, I was thinking of it, and it really, just as I thought of it, the whole thing kind of came back. It's still there as fresh, the kind of memory of it. That I remember the night I, we, I, I went to this house, the first time I met believers, and they brought me to this house. It was a youth kind of meeting. It wasn't an official church meeting. They had a move. And they were all, they showed a video or did a presentation on some Africa. One of them was looking, supporting some Africa mission. And then they had prayer and we were all sitting on the floor. And I remember, and they all prayed kind of one, one like this. And then uh, I remember sitting on the floor there and I just saying in, in my heart and going, I found it. I found it. This is it. And they were, they were great believers. And I went home that night. I had a motorcycle. I drove home and it just felt like the bike was just flew just one meter off the ground. Like a lot of joy. And there is, when you get saved first, there's you know, sometimes a lot of joy. And sometimes that goes away a little bit. And it can go away because God tests us a little. He wants us to live by faith and not by the feeling of it. And He can just withdraw a little bit of the sense of His presence. That the just shall live by faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. But if you miss that, and you mourn after it and desire it that I want the presence of God back and you mourn for it he says you'll be comforted but if it's like okay well you know I entertain I watch the soccer and that and the, the second one is we do sin if any man says and just as we finish if any man says I do not sin he is a liar and the truth is not in us if we say we do not have sin we deceive ourselves and we call God a liar but and that is in us. And if we ever sin, we lose a sense of the presence of God. We lose the joy. We lose a peace. We lose the communion with God. We can lose fellowship with other believers. We can lose the boldness of a good conscience. And we can lose confidence in prayer. And if we lose that, and when Cain lost the presence of God because of his sin, it says he went out from the presence of God. And he went out and lost the presence of God. But he didn't mourn. He built a city. He got busy. I've got a lot going on in my life. I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm on the go. I've got all this going on in my life. But he never mourned for the loss of the presence of God. And, and also when, when Saul sinned and the presence of God was taken, Samuel says, the presence of God is gone from you. It's gone to David, the anointing of God. And he didn't mourn. He says to Samuel, okay, but honor me in front of the people. As long as I still have my position and as long as I still have my status and my place, I can live without the presence of God. But when David sinned, a worse, much worse sin than Saul, David says in Psalm 51, Take not thy presence, cast me not away from your presence, take not your spirit from me. Don't restore to me the joy of your salvation, renew a steadfast spirit in me. He mourned. And he was comforted. God came back to him. And Moses, when he lost the presence of God because the people sinned, he said to God, God says, go, go and an angel will go with you today. He says, if you don't go with us, we'll not go. And uh, he, wanted, he wanted them to go. So, blessed are they that mourn. And they'll be comforted. <clears throat> blessed are they that, that are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's righteousness. It's peace and it's joy, and uh, it's the poor in spirit. And not only not only is it is it righteousness, but the poor in spirit 
who say, I can't live this Christian life. No matter what way I try, there's no ability. I'm good for a while, and then, then I just go back into the same. And when we realize, I can't do this, then we call on God, and He will give us, to those poor in spirit, He'll give us the spirit, and we can say, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ. So Lord, thank you for, uh, Lord, that, that uh, uh, for your nature that you've given to us, Lord, that you've given us this spirit, Lord, that is in us, and that, Lord, you are uh, meek and lowly of heart, and we pray, Lord, that we wouldn't take our example from the world who has no time for this uh, way, and uh, we just thank you, blessed are we, Lord, happy and we end it. Amen. Can we all stand? Can we all stand for the reading of the word? Okay, we'll read uh, three three verses from different places. Okay, we'll read uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I think already Bishu read it, but we'll read it again. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, and to give you a future and a hope. Okay, one more verse from Psalm 139. Okay, Psalm 139. Okay, and uh, verse 16. Okay. Your eyes see my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they are all were written. The days fashioned for me. When as yet there were none of them. And one more verse from Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the words we already heard. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the songs that we heard this morning, victorious songs. Lord, we give you glory today. Lord, you deserve all today. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for... Lord, for our lives, thank you that you have been good to us. You are a good God. You never thought evil about us. Lord, thank you, Jesus, today. Thank you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. We thank you for every wonderful gift that you've given us in our lives, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We exalt you. Lord, we pray that you would take this message forward today. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord, work in this word today. Minister to us, all of us. Lord, let your word be real to our hearts today. Lord, affirm us with the truth of the word. Deep in our hearts that our faith would grow. Lord, we just pray for these things. Lord, we lift up also Pastor Carl right now. We pray for his recovery, Lord. We just lift him up. Lord, we pray for Pastor Fred today, Lord, also Pastor Rajan. Lord, we pray for healing. You are a God who healeth. Lord, there's victory in your name, there's power in your name. Lord, these lives could be transformed to your name, Father. Lord, do something today in our midst today. Lord, do something. There's somebody here, Lord, who needs something. Lord, that would change, Lord, everything in their life in a moment, Lord. Through your word, Father, we thank you. Bless us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Okay. Okay, it's going to be a wonderful message and also it's a New Year message. Similar to something like Vishu said, okay. New Year is still with us, okay. It's the last Sunday of this month, okay. But Psalm 139.16, David was writing this beautiful psalm. And he says uh, that the days of David's life was written in a book. And, he's, and he affirms that God's prior knowledge of or plan of everything of his life is written in that book. Isn't that amazing? 
in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says God is the Alpha and the Omega that is not only just the beginning of our lives he also what happens in between and also the end he is the Alpha and the end and what's happening in between that is control of everything in our lives in that encourages us today yes. okay and uh, and I was thinking Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 God again affirms here that his plans towards us are not evil but it's good and it has a great future and a great hope now these three verses we can just read and we can go home isn't it these are powerful words about God's future for a believer I was thinking and I titled this this message as God has written your story and you can all say that in your hearts today that God has written your story that's what psalmist says in Psalm 139 we just read that God has already written our story He's Alpha and Omega did you ever watch the cricket match that was already over you know like you're watching a World Cup final and you know India won we know how Dhoni got out everything in the same way God in heaven looks at us and he says I know don't worry what's happening in your life I know everything like Corey Ten Boom said in heaven there is no panic only plans isn't that good like God is not surprised with everything that happens in this earth in our lives because he knows everything he has written a story about you he knows your beginning he knows your end and what's more amazing is he is with us throughout the process isn't that, isn't that amazing I was listening yesterday as I was uh, as my son was having his haircut, I was listening to a message of Pastor Carl Silva, our pastor. Okay, and in, in that message he was preaching in Baltimore. And he said this powerful statement in that he was speaking on the storms. And he said, when, when, when the storms come in, in, in the sea, the, one of the things the ships or the captains do in the ships is they put the anchors. And what happens is as soon as you put the anchor, the ship or, or the ship stops. But as a believer, we have an anchor that is Jesus Christ. And our life doesn't stop with the storms that come into our lives. Even the anchor, our anchor keeps us moving. Isn't that amazing? We don't stop when things come in our lives because our God is moving us through in those storms. That's an encouraging thought this morning. That no matter what happens in our lives, God is control of all the things. We see, I, I, we see at the time of salvation, at the time of salvation, Jesus died for us on the cross and he was resurrected from the tomb and he's alive. And through that, through God's great love, he revealed to us his grace and mercy towards us. Isn't that true? His love was revealed to us and that love that was revealed to us was his grace and mercy that you and me don't deserve it but Jesus died for us because of what he did on the cross today God looks at each one of us and says or declares us righteous that means he says you're perfect that means when God looks at you and me he says he sees as if that we never sinned isn't that amazing like God, God looks at us and says you're perfect because of my son Jesus Christ because I see each one of you through Jesus Christ when Jesus is in our lives everything is awesome isn't it everything is like we could be having every day a new year isn't it like every day you don't have to wait for the 31st of every year we, can, we could have a new life new joy new peace every morning and this truth because Jesus has set us free and made us righteous through his grace and his mercy, this upsets the devil. You know what upsets us? To what, why today we go through things in our life? Do you know that? Because of the grace that is bestowed to us by Jesus Christ. He upset, he's upset because he's upset with the grace that was given to a man that was taken out of the dust. That Christ came, the creator of the universe came down for that man and grace upsets him. Demons and his forces are upset with our lives. When Jesus was on the earth, he had two major enemies. One was the devil and the other, other group of people were the Jewish Pharisees who are very legalistic, who hated the grace message. 
By the way, nothing changed today. The devil hates the message of grace and a believer who is operating in the finished work of grace. Are you listening today? You wonder why things are happening to me in my life or what, why storms are happening, why these things are moving in my life. The only answer is because you are a grace believer, you have, God has given you and declared you righteous. Because of that, we have an enemy and we have things that go through in our lives. In parallel story, we also see in the Old Testament and Genesis chapter 37 verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph and he gave him a coat. No, he gave him a coat, the coat of many colors. And what happened? Because of that coat and because Jacob loved, his brothers hated. It is it, it almost like Almost like Joseph's, Joseph's life was in danger because of that quote. I think it, 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 we, can, we can picture that quote as a righteousness that God gave us. But what's amazing is that we see, in spite of all that, that Joseph went through, you see something in, in Genesis chapter 39, you, you, you see this word going through every verse that says, God's hand was upon Joseph. God's hand was upon Joseph. God's favor was upon Joseph. God's favor was upon Joseph. And that's an amazing principle to all of us. No matter what we go through in our lives, God's good hand is upon us. God is with us. God's favor is with us. Nothing evil can take over. Like all, God is a good God. God, God doesn't even think evil. Every good plan comes from God. Every perfect gift comes from God. These are, these are amazing thoughts to ponder this morning. And, and God, like this is amazing. When God declared us righteous, God declared us righteous, but He didn't make us righteous immediately. Remember this very important thought. God declared righteous to all of us. God, when He sees us, He sees us righteous. But today we still have our old sin nature. This is very important. God does two things to a believer. Number one, he declares us righteous and the second thing he does is he is progressively sanctifying us. He is making us more like Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 6 says, the one who began a good work, the good work is salvation. The one who began a good work in you is working in your life and my life to perfect us so that one day Jesus could see himself in us. Isn't that amazing? Like we become a mirror one day when, we, when Jesus sees us. Isn't that awesome? Like God, God is perfecting us in sanctification. He is perfecting us. Now He made us righteous. So God is like, we, we don't become sinless. We don't become like a holy people. But we have still, still our old sin nature. But we don't sin so much we used to be. But we're becoming more, more and more like Jesus Christ. Did you ever thought like you were not the same last year and now? You are something that is, you have grown, you are matured, you are transformed, you are more like Christ in every day, every year that we pass through. That's what God is doing in your life and my life. And through this sanctification, God has to work. God has to put us in different stages in our life in sanctification. To perfecting, towards perfecting us, He has to put us into different stages in our lives so that one day you will be a perfect vessel so that He could use and see uh, Himself in the mirror. So today we will go through a wonderful story through the life of Joseph in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And we see how God was progressively working in Joseph's life because God was in the process of sanctifying him and is also is, is in the process of sanctifying your life and my life so that he would be, you and me would be a vessel that he already planned in his mind. Because he already written a story about us. He knows our future. Where is our end going to be and how we are going to end. By the way, our end is always going to be good. Say amen to that. Amen. But devil's hand is the lake of fire. But your, when, whenever he comes with thoughts in our lives, tell him, we know your end, I know our end. Our end is going to be wonderful in heaven. Okay, so we will see through the life of Joseph. We see four stages of Joseph's life. 
Okay, number one, we see now Joseph is an amazing God, gave him wonderful dreams, the visions that, is, that one day his brothers will bow down to him. They would all bow down to him and even his father will bow down to him and God gave him some amazing dreams. By the way, God gives us those dreams too when you become a believer. God gives you a vision. God says, you know what? I have a great plans for you. Ten years from now, this is what I have something for you. And those things, and we store it in our hearts, we store it in our hearts and the years go by, we see those things like coming out. And all we could say, wow, I, could, I, 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 I have the habit of marking the promises. And every time I look at my old Bible, I see those promises come to pass. And God gives us those dreams. By the way, those dreams are amazing. And those dreams are going to come to pass. Whatever God gives us in a vision, God is going to accomplish. By the way, His vision is always connected with the Word of God. He gives us, He promises, He gives us promises, dreams or visions through, through the confirmations of the Word of God. I make it very clear. Others, you come up with every dream is like, no, you could have some dreams. Okay, but dream is always conformed with the word of God. And God gave Joseph a wonderful dream. But through that dream, like God gives his dream, but God says, okay, that's great, but I need to work in you, Joseph. I need to, there's a work that needs to be established in your life. So he goes and his father has given him a coat. By the way, coat, what, what is coat in those days? Everybody would wear a coat. What is so different about this coat? In those days, everybody would wear a coat till the ankle length. But the Joseph, the coat that Joseph was wearing was a, a knee length. Okay, Joseph's coat was ankle length. It speaks about royalty. Only the princes or, or kings would wear. And that's how God looks at you and me also in our lives. He gave us his, his righteousness, isn't it? Jesus gave his righteousness that the royalty that God puts upon us. And this was hated by his brothers. They said, how can this guy get the favor? How can this happen to him? So they threw him in the pit. And, and imagine for a moment Joseph in the pit. The first stage we see in Joseph's life, he's in the pit. And he's wondering like, like all of a moment, all of a sudden, is all his plans were shattered. He was thinking, God... What is going to happen to me? All the things that you have shared to me. It looks like I'm going to die in this pit. If I stay too long, there's nothing food. I'm not going to be able to eat anything. I'm going to die in starvation. Lord, you look at down, there's nothing down there. Nothing side in the front, like nothing. All he could look at, P. Joseph was, look up. Look up and trust God. By the way, we will go through those times in our lives. Like we don't have to be in a literal pit, but we will go through situations in those times. But we all we could do is, all our effort will become vain. All our energy would become vain. All our, all our knowledge would become vain. But only one thing that we could trust is God. Have you ever been in those places? And you said, God help! God help! No other way, no, 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 no other way I can do anything, God. I, I look at my bank balances, there's nothing there. I, I look at, I go to every doctor, nothing is happening. God, there's only one hope that is you. And that's where Joseph was in his life. By the way, God puts us in that stage in our life. Jonah, Jonah was in the fish's belly. Can you imagine? He was, his hand, all he could look is up. And what's amazing is God, God is amazing. God rescues us, isn't it? God rescued Jonah. God rescued Joseph. God comes through. Because you know what? God has already written our story. He knows our beginning and the end. Your, is, your end is not in that pit, by the way. Your end is much bigger. And God is not going to leave you in that pit. God is waiting and is working in our life and God is doing something amazing in Joseph's life where his trust would be only God alone. And we see that David is, David, like Joseph is put in the pit. 
and we see the story the Egyptians come and the Egyptians or whoever comes and they pick him up and then he, he was taken now to the Pharaoh's home, Potiphar's home. And there he got a good job, nice job, nice food, nice accommodation, everything is fine. And, and I believe Joseph thought, wow, this is great, that's awesome. It's the second stage, Potiphar's, Potiphar's home. Nice home, all settled, nice job, nice money, I have all my medical claims coming in, all settled, everything is over. But and we could sometimes be in that stage and say, okay, that's awesome, that's awesome. Like, God, you've been good to me. You removed me from the pit and you gave me a safe place. But God is going to tell Joseph, that's not my plan for you. That's not my plan for you. That's not my plan for you. Potiphar's home was not the final for you. I have something else for you. That's not my story for you. By the way, it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, his, like, his plans are higher, isn't it? His thoughts are higher. He doesn't want us to just like, blessing is not just like financial blessings. Much more than that. And we see in his Potiphar's home, now, now he was tempted now in that place. Joseph is going great. Now Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. God here was testing something in Joseph's life. God was testing Joseph's loyalty. By the way, in the temptations, God is going to test your loyalty. Like I wrote it down, we cannot say we love God until we had to make some hard choices on his behalf. We can't say I love God, but I do what I like to do. Are you listening today? You can't say, Lord, I love you, but I also love you this. No, God is saying, like, you can't do that. You can't sail on the two boats. Like God said to Peter, do you love me then more than these things? Do you really love me, Peter, in John chapter 21? Do you love me more than this fish? Peter loved his fish and his boat. You see, often running back, running back, running back to the boat. After God is resurrected, he's still going after the boat. And God, Jesus, comes to that shore and says, Do you really love me more than this fish? More than this boat? Do you really love me? Come on, it's, it's time that we need to sort it out. It's time that you and me to need to debate ourselves and sort it out whom you really like love me. And we know that story. And you know what? Peter became a preacher in Acts chapter 2. We see Abraham was tested. Abraham, do you really love me? Now I'm going to say something. The one whom you love the so, so much, Isaac, I want him to put it at the altar. It's not like God is going to take away the things that you love you so much. God is going to give it back. He gave Isaac back to Abraham. God is testing your loyalty. What you love the most. And we see the story, God says to Abraham in Genesis 22, 12, Now I know, Abraham, that you fear me. Isn't that amazing? Now I know. Now I know when you put Isaac at the altar, that I could trust you. A faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. God has to test our faith. God has to work on our faith. Is it, is it trustworthy before I could do something in your life much bigger? God has to come to that point in our lives where your faith has to be tested. He needs to know that your faith is fully upon him alone. And what's amazing is Joseph passes this test. He says to the Potiphar's wife, you know what? Even if you agree, your husband agree, I, my God doesn't agree this. I'm going to leave this place no matter how good your job is. I'm going to leave. Even if I have to take it, I have to go to the prison, I'm going to go. I'm going to stand with God. Isn't that amazing conviction to have? Like Joseph had that conviction. I'm going to go to prison. Even if you falsely accuse me, which I didn't do, I'm going to go for the truth. I will not forsake the truth. I will not, I will not just sell the truth, Bible says in Proverbs. I will not sell the truth. I know the truth and the truth will set me free. I will never sell it. It's very important. And Joseph, he passed the test. 
Now he is in the prison. Remember, he is falsely accused. He didn't do anything. But he's in the prison. By the way, that's, that's amazing. We could be in that times in our life where we didn't do anything. But we could be falsely accused. People may say things against us. People could malign us. People could go against touch, which you didn't do. What do you do? That's like a prison-like situation. But you know what? Dave, Joseph understood God was with him in the prison. In that prison, the baker and the butler came. And they're very sad. And Joseph asked him, why are you sad? And they say, because we were put in the prison. But where was Joseph? In the same prison. Look at his attitude. His attitude changed, isn't it? He knew in the prison, God is with him. In, the, in his prison-like situation in our lives, we know God is with us. He has written a story about us. Paul and Silas were put in the prison. You know what? What an amazing attitude, isn't it? They were singing and praising the Lord. They were not worried about what happened to them. The, 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 they were beaten up. They are not worried about their hurt. They are not worried about where they are in. But they are singing praises to God. What an amazing attitude. When we go through trials, it's good that we have that kind of attitude. Your attitude makes a lot of difference. Your attitude can threaten the devil. We don't want to be like, like naggy Christians. We believe God is in control of my life no matter what happens. And Joseph understood that, that God is with him. God, he has a hope that beyond this earth, he had a great hope. Paul said in first in first in second first Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen, he said, "We go through sufferings, but I have a living hope of resurrection. I have a hope that's beyond beyond my reach. That's where my hope goes." And we see that like that there, there is in our prison-like situation. What is your attitude? Do I still believe God? God has already written my story. Romans eight twenty-eight. All things work together for good. All things, if you are a believer, all things work together for good. Though there is no ifs and buts in this verse. If you are spiritual or if you do this, no. If you are a believer, all things are going to work together for your good. Because God has a plan and He's written your story. He has a plan. Finally, now, now, now He comes to the palace. From the prison, the four P's, isn't it? From the pit to, to Potiphar's home, from Potiphar's home to prison, from prison to palace, and from palace to prime minister. Five P's. Okay, we'll see this. Okay, now he goes to palace, and suddenly everything changes in Joseph's life. He interprets the dream of the king, and king makes him a prime minister. All of a sudden, in a moment, in a moment, everything changed. I believe when that happened, Joseph, I believe Joseph didn't think about the pit. I believe Joseph didn't think about the Potiphar's home. I believe J Joseph didn't think about the prison. All he saw is where God put him there. Isn't that amazing? And one day, by the way, one day when we see Jesus in heaven, everything changes. Everything changes. All the trials that we go through, all the sufferings that we go through will vanish in a moment. In a moment. In a moment, everything changes. I believe this is an amazing thing in application. In one day, when we meet Jesus in a moment, everything changes. All we suffered, all the burdens that we went through, all the struggles we went through, the trials we endured, the sickness that we endured will not matter anymore. Because we see Jesus face to face. Now we have no more this body, but a resurrection body. Isn't that amazing? And, and no more pain, no more trials, no more sufferings, no more sickness, no more financial burdens. All free, you're set free. Wow, what an amazing moment that would be. As I was thinking about this story, Simon, Simon came into my mind. How many of you know Simon Saul? You know? 
is amazing. When I was new in the church, Pastor Carl once gave me an assignment to stay with him in the hospital for two nights. And, uh, and I, was, I was there and uh, I could see, I could see his, his nerves and his hands moving, running so fast because of the dialysis. And, and I was in the night uh, helping him out in the hospital and uh, one of the things I saw in his life with all his pain, he never spoke about his pain. He would always talk about Jesus, how good he is. His attitude is amazing. And as a new believer, I was amazed, who's this man? He's talking about God and his sufferings. But imagine, one day Simon went to be with the Lord. Everything changed. No more sickness. He's amazing, he's beautiful. This week we had Artie Shaman and Mamta at our home. And we were talking and talking and talking and talking never ended. Like for many hours we were talking. And I was, and Auntie Sharman was telling me about, about Connie, like things that he went through in the last days. But I was thinking about today he's in heaven. Beautifully. All things are changed. He's made new. Ravi, like, like, like amazing, isn't it? Like he's beautiful. Today, standing before the King of Kings. You know what? When we meet Jesus, all that we went through years will never matter. Everything will vanish. Everything will go away. Because God has a story. He's already written your story. I'll close with very few thoughts. Joseph's brother saw him as a dreamer. But God saw him as a Prime Minister. Isn't that amazing? You need to know how God sees you. Not what like the world sees you. What like devils wants to see us as. But we want to see what God sees us. I wrote it, David, Jesse's father saw him as a shepherd boy. His brothers saw him as a keeper of the sheep. Saul saw him as a young lad. But God saw him as the one who would kill Goliath and be the king of Israel. Wow! It's powerful, isn't it? That's what God thinks. God always has a great future for you. Don't worry with these little things that we go through. Never underestimate your life, where you now, like where you are now, but look and believe what God has in, your heart, in his heart. God has big plans for you. His plans are good, perfect, specifically custom made for you. Isn't that amazing? Custom made, you know, custom made or, or what do you call it in the travel business? Like, like a plan made exactly with the way you love it. They'll see your emotions, the way things you love it. They'll, tra they'll plan your travel holiday plan accordingly. In the same way, God is custom plan. That's what the word Psalm 139 says. You are custom made plan for me, God. Specifically the way I am, the way the plan you made it for me. God has a custom area. My plan is not your plan. God has a different plan for each one. And his plans are wonderful. God is working towards his plan. And one day he could see in us. Jesus said, let's cross to the other side. That is the very hope he gives us today, isn't it? Let us cross to the other side. Don't worry what's happening in between. I said, let's cross over other side. Don't worry what's happening. The storms will come. I am there to handle it. Who still the storm? The disciples or Jesus? Jesus still the storm. Who walked on the water? Is Jesus? Of course, Jesus walked on the water. After that, Peter walked. Jesus said, don't worry about the storms that will come in your life. But I am going to be with you. God has written your story and mine. He's the Alpha and the Omega. No surprises for him because he knows from the beginning, from the end. Isn't that amazing? Like we could enter this 2019, like knowing my story is already written and complete. Screenplay directed by God. Isn't that amazing? He has a perfect story. Before I close, I, I want you to read a wonderful poem, okay? I have a wonderful poem, okay? I know many of you know this poem, but this goes with this message, okay? I'll put it on the slide here and I'll read it. Okay, just one sip of water. <laughs> When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When he yearns with all his heart 
to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into a trial shapes of clay which only God understands. While his tortured heart is, heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks, when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out, God knows what he is about. God knows what he is about in your life. He knows your future. Don't worry about the bends that he's doing. Don't worry about the things that is happening. God is, God's, God's tender hand is upon your life and my life. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's close in prayer. And Father, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. If you are here tonight, you never believed in this God that we just spoke. God loves you. He not just loves you, but He loves you so much that He left heavens for you and He died for you on the cross. And, and they buried Him, He rose again on the third day because He's God. He's God. And this God wants to come into your life this morning. You are here not by an accident. You are here because God wants you to know this truth. If you want to have this Jesus in, in your life, you can pray this simple prayer in your heart and believe Jesus as your personal savior. You could say this prayer after me in your heart. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. You can pray this simple prayer in your heart and believe Jesus. And you know what? When he comes into your life, no matter what you go through, like he is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. What an amazing thought. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you're here today, he wants to come into your life. All you could do is just believe in Him. You can say this simple prayer, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I want to be saved. His only way for salvation is believing upon you and your work on the cross. I believe that you died for me and rose again. I accept you as my personal Savior. I believe in you this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand? Uh, did we enjoy the first song, Raise a Hallelujah? Can we do it again? Yes. Can you clap aloud? Can you sing aloud?
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.